In May of last year, I lost my dad to brain cancer. He was 77 years old. My dad was a very capable man. Really physical, really active. And then just watch it generally, just become a shell of themselves. And I don't think anyone really prepares you for it either. It's like well, lots of things in life. It's like you have to go through it like the first time in spite, in spite of the fact that millions and millions of families have done it with members of their family. When it happens to your family for the first time, it's very tough. His health deteriorated over a relatively short space of time. We spent his final days with him in a hospital. But for many, the final phase of life is a much longer process and access to quality care is very hard to come by. There are 1.5 million older people in the UK who don't receive the care and the support they need. Many being forced to rely on friends and family due to a current shortfall of over 70,000 places in care homes in England. And that's a number which is likely to increase as our aging population continues to rise. So Tony Robinson is an English actor, comedian and TV presenter. He is also patron of older people's charity Alive, which works to transform the residential care sector. So Tony, the reason I wanted to have a conversation with you is to understand just how much of a crisis the UK is in, in terms of its treatment and care for the elderly. Yeah. It's clearly a great big uh, problem in the UK. The idea that the care system is basically all right, it just needs a bit of money or a clever woman or man in charge, I think is totally flawed. I think we need to entirely rethink who the elderly are, how they fit into society, how we fit in with them, all, all that kind of stuff. It's like these people, sort of people-ish, <laughs> old people, um, they have no link to the rest of the society. Why do you think there's such a problem in terms of their place in society and people's, I guess, connection to them once they reach that age and they become, use the word people-ish? up until maybe 10 or 20 years ago. The grandma and the grandpa were sort of central to what was going on. Who did you learn to cook from? It was them, you listened to their stories. They are respected, they are seen as repositories of, of knowledge. We, we've lost that in, entirely. So we can't see what it is that the elderly might have which could be of use to us. I think we're very bad at doing that in this in this country. You talk about respect, Sir Tony, and you and you, when really big events happen in the world, yeah. and I'm thinking now of the event of the last few years, you're looking at COVID, yeah. and that kind of exposes, I think, in some ways, a society's relationship with the elderly and how the treatment of elderly people differed in a way that we look back on and say, we're just not proud of that. We're not proud of how we looked after those yeah, people. Yeah, perfect example. Bussing people who hadn't yet been checked as to whether or not they had COVID and some who we knew had COVID, bussing them into care homes yeah. to keep the beds clear in hospitals. What monster dreamed that up? Yeah. Whose parents would have died in care homes because that decision was made? I just don't think you're thought of in the same way. You are thought of as a problem, a problem that needs to be managed. And as long as that is the predominant feeling within society, then those people will be dehumanised. So your own personal experience, yeah. so I know you lost both of your parents uh, to dementia, um, and just how difficult that journey was for you, and I guess how that changed and opened your eyes and is now leaving you in this position where you feel very passionate and very strongly about yeah. something needing to change. When I look back, on the story of my dad and how ghastly it all was. It still hurts me inside when I talk about it. Yeah. It was quite swift actually before my dad was in such a state that he had to, to go into hospital. And when he was in hospital, they realized how advanced his Alzheimer's was. He couldn't come back to us because we wouldn't have been able to care for him. They didn't want to bed block the hospital so he was sent to what we're calling in those days a mental hospital. And he was in there for about six months, and I think it was my, probably the most awful time of his life. And those, I guess those visits, you still probably remember lots of those visits. Like yeah, they merge into one, don't they? Yeah. You know, those things. It's like when you, when you have a physical pain, you don't remember every single day, you just remember the pain. 
If you're giving um, advice to someone whose parents or grandparents are elderly, they're becoming ill, they're, they're going to have to be in a position where they are cared for, yeah. what advice would you be giving them from everything you've learned? A lot of people who run care homes are really good people and wouldn't want to uh, anybody to think otherwise, but try and find the reports on that care home. See what outside invigilators are saying. Ask the doctors. Don't trust the organisation, not because the organisation is necessarily bad, but because like any organisation, it's going to defend its own interests. Yeah. So if we were going to reinvent the UK's care system, uh, what do you think the big ask is? What do you think we want, we want to end up with? What we want to see is fluidity. We don't want to see the over 65s as the problem and the other 65s, under 65s, putting their hands in their wallets and saying, this money is the solution. We want older people to be integrated back into society and for their needs to be responded to within the context of society, yeah. not outside it. Yeah, absolutely. I understand that in a way I didn't at the start of the conversation. Very helpful. So Tony was right. The reports make for grim reading. There are nearly 24,000 care homes in England, with 16% of them rated inadequate or requiring improvement. Of nearly 3,000 inspections carried out in 2022, more than 200 of them were inadequate and over 1,000 required improvement. The Octopus Real Estate team has been building care homes for over half a decade, one of which is Buckler's Lodge, a care home in Crowthorne we built in 2021. I wanted to visit Buckler's Lodge and see how they're dealing with the demand for quality care. Pam has been a resident here for nearly a year. She moved here with her husband, Ted, who sadly passed away a few months later. I wanted to speak to Pam about the care and the support she's received during her time here. How lovely. Thank My you pleasure. so much. When did you decide that um, a care home was the right thing for you? And did you make that decision? Well, I suppose in a way, Ted and I did make that decision, although it wasn't an easy decision to make. Um, we didn't particularly want to do it. And just, just tell me, when you say you didn't want to uh, go into a care home, what, why, did you, why did you not want to do that? Well, I think because I'd read things. Yeah. <laughs> well, you might not get the visitors you think you'll have, and. Uh, even in a place like this, you see people and they only have visitors maybe once a month, if that. And, and, and I think that's very sad, I think. Yeah. And are those people, are those people very lonely? Yeah, yes, they must be, because even I'm lonely at times. Yeah. And how, how did this all feel for you? Tracy, when you were making a decision that your mum and your dad were going into care home? There is this feeling of guilt. Could I be doing more? I know sometimes she can be very unhappy and because she's lonely. I mean, I've actually been having a chat with another relative of a resident here and we've been talking about much the same thing and whether there can be more one-to-one -one interaction with residents, particularly if they don't feel well enough to join in group activities. I think the one thing that does bring people together is church. And, um, and of course, you, you're just not well enough to go. Yeah. I'd like to take Mum, but it is difficult. She doesn't feel strong enough, you know. I could take her in the wheelchair and that, but it, you find it, everything a bit exhausting, don't you? So. Yes. And if that's been a huge part of your life, uh, which it clearly has. I'm not surprised that's upsetting. And I th I'm sure it would help some people here. Is there a high turnover of staff? Does staff come and go quite frequently? They've definitely lost some, some very good staff, which has been a shame. Generally, I find the staff are very, very good. I think they're very kind. When my dad was ill and, and then when, when he passed away and since then, They've done a tremendous amount to do all they can to make mum comfortable. In a way, they, they bend over backwards to make things right for you. 
So what, what are some of the things they do that make you feel special? We have a quiz um, afternoon and that's, that's enjoyable. How do you do in the quiz? When Ted was alive, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I do curse him sometimes for going. <laughs> it sounds like uh, the relationship that you have, the, the personal relationship you have with the carers is the most important relationship. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, so actually the people are at the heart of the care home. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, and they are very good. Now, it's clear that Pam feels looked after and cared for, but it struck me that even in a place like this, at times she's still lonely and doesn't feel part of the community, echoing the concerns made by Sir Tony. So I wanted to speak to Debbie, the general manager of Buckler's Lodge, about what plans she may have to resolve this. So one of the things when I talked to Pam, she said for her and for most of the residents in there, 90, 95% of the people that come into the care home are family members. Yeah, uh, and it doesn't extend beyond that. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. So it's the end of the all kind of connection with the wider world, is that fair? Yeah. We're just looking to start a mother and toddler group to come in and be with our residents. We have outside um, entertainers come in. We have an exercise lady that comes in. Now all the restrictions of COVID are over, we're starting to look at bringing more people into the home. And one of the things she really missed was the opportunity to go to the Methodist Church just down the road. So I know she was talking about initiatives of bringing the church into the care home, but also a way to connect some of your residents to acres of woodland that yeah. you have right on your front door. With the church, we are talking to people to try and get some communities into the home to do services. Um, and we're also hoping to get our own minibus. Now, if we get that, that's another way that we can get to the local churches, take the resident to the church. Yes, we're on the hunt for a minibus at the moment so that we can start taking them out. We have asked local communities to get involved, but I think it's someone needs to take that first step. I mean, when I first started in care, you had day centres everywhere for the elderly. They're just very few and far between now. So knowing everything you know about care of the elderly and the role that care homes play, what would you want more than anything else? For people to come in more and see how a care home runs and maybe have a day centre within a care home because that would integrate more people then. Pam was talking about probably the most important relationship she has is with the care workers that you're employing. So what kind of people are you looking for when you, when you hire them? We have a list of questions and it's from those that you can see if they've got empathy with what they want to do. And when they're like, yeah, I don't mind working weekends, yeah, I can do that, you're like, okay, yes, this is someone that is really passionate. Obviously, because it's such a large care home, it's just making sure that you've got enough staff in to look after our residents. Nobody wants to work in care anymore, unfortunately. And why is that? It is unsocial hours, weekends, they have to work Christmas, and you've got all your local stores paying really good money at the moment. I knew going into today, that we needed more quality care homes to address the growing need for elderly care in the UK. What I wasn't expecting to learn was that the relationships residents have with staff and the engagement they have with their local community are just as important as comfort and care. Speaking to Debbie, it's clear that her team have built an environment where that's embedded within the very nature of the service they provide. But it's an approach that's clearly not representative of the care sector as a whole. Spending the day at Buckler's Lodge has filled me with hope because if we can successfully replicate this model across the rest of the UK, I think we can help integrate the elderly within the very society that they help to build.